Today at school we were praying Dhuhr prayer and the students that were a bit cold outside because we had to pray. They go, sir, it's cold for Salat. I said to them, Jahannam is colder. <laughs> and uh, they said to me, sir, you're such a quirky person. I said, yeah, quirky is my second name. Jahannam is cold. You know, there is Zamharir in Jahannam. Would you believe that? Jahannam has hot and has cold. And the cold is so cold that it burns. La ilaha illa. It's called Zamharir. So I wasn't yani, making fun. A'udhu billah. My brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. So last week we finished off lesson number five and we completed the biography of the great Khalifa Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And just to recap very quickly towards the end of his life and we'll transition to this one. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had ruled as a Khalifa or had been a Khalifa. Maybe the proper word is not ruled, but he was entrusted with the Khilafah for almost two years. Just two years, subhanAllah. And the types of people he led needed a person like him. And when those two years were over, it seemed that people who are now ready for a transition, for somebody who was a little bit different in his mindset and approach, Especially that in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, for the first time, the Muslim ummah had spread outside of Arabia. And they had just reached the Romans who had occupied the lands of the Arabs that were once for the Arabs in Syria. Syria those days was different to the Syria today. It was, it's known as the Greater Syria. Another name for it is Transjordan. But they were a combination of Lebanon, Syria, today, Palestine, a bit of Jordan, Asham. And it was occupied by the Byzantines, the ancient Romans. And the great Khalid ibn al-Walid, the great commander, the one whom the history has never seen a commander and a general like, from whom even non-Muslims today have written and learned from his strategies of combat and war, he was assigned as the commander and general by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to call him the unsheathed sword of Allah. That's what the Prophet sallallahu called him. Sayfullah al-Maslul, the unsheathed sword of Allah. And he put him as a commander and that by the will of Allah opened the entire world for the Muslims. Of course, the Muslims did not just go and attack. Allah says, Allah does not... Allah says, fight them as they fight you, but do not transgress. But it was a necessary battle between them and the people outside because they were a threat. And there's something in war fair today which is legal. And it's always been legal. It's called preemptive strike. A person can do preemptive strikes. It's international law and it's an Islamic law from the beginning. When there is a real and direct perceived threat that is real, from the enemy. And they refused to make a truce with you. The Persians and the Romans had become a threat because it started at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and was continuing. So the battle continued and Khalid bin Walid, by the will of Allah, had led the armies and conquered the first half of what Muslims had conquered in the next few years. Muslims reached from what is equivalent from Spain to China. Nearly a third of the world. And the way they spread was in the beginning was through conquests for a short time. And then through trade, through missionaries, through integration and migration. But the best way was through da'wah. They used to go and speak about Islam. And they used to interact with them in their trade and business and live among them. And show them what Islam teaches them of how they get along with people. Muslims and Islam welcomed people of different religions. That lived under the Islamic empire. And they were given their entire rights and autonomy. They had their own churches, their own synagogues. They even had their own courts. Which they had to govern by their Bible or their Torah for example. And... They were allowed, if they drank alcohol, to drink alcohol and wine within their territories that were designated. 
So the Muslims gave them enormous rights and they were called Zummiyun, which means those entrusted under Islamic Empire to the Muslims. And they had rights like everyone else, but including rights of their religious laws. And they had to pay, however, something called a jizya. It's similar to a tax system, but not exactly like the tax we know. It's designated, it's only a very small amount. And in return, they give them their safety and security. It was necessary that they take this tax from them, because the non-Muslims were not obliged to pay zakat. The Muslims, however, are obliged by Allah to pay zakat. So the Muslims are paying zakat, and they consider it an honorable thing, and it's an act of worship. And the non-Muslims living under treaty and truce, not a treaty, sorry, as citizens under the Islamic Empire paid a jizya, which is another form of tax. And with that jizya, the Muslim government used it to support them and to develop their roads and help them maintain themselves. They went back into them, yani went back into the non-Muslims' lands and the non-Muslims' territories, not territories, maybe the non-Muslims' uh, residents in the Islamic Empire. This, I'm saying this because some people, they may trick you to say they hear the word jizya because most people today are social media uh, fanatics. They just listen to what social media says. They listen to little bits and pieces. They don't know what jizya is. So you need to equip yourself with knowledge, my brothers and sisters. A jizya is a tax system for the non-Muslims who live under the Islamic Empire as citizens. They have rights and autonomy, and they get to tra um, practice their religion. Nobody's allowed to touch their places of worship in Muslim lands. And instead of paying zakat, which is upon the Muslims, they pay taxes. And those taxes go back for them. The government uses and manages them for them. So my brothers and sisters... The non-Muslims lived in harmony and peace among them. And they advanced more than what they used to ever advance before Islam came into their lives. In fact, every time Khalid and Walid and the, the time of Abu Bakr Dilano, they conquered lands, the citizens there, most of them were Arabs, and some of the Byzantines, the old, ancient Romans, found how trustworthy and honest and, and kind and merciful these Muslims were, that they were happier under their rule than ever before. The books are full of... History books are full of these, these statements, but unfortunately, um, in the Western world, you don't study the history from an Islamic perspective. And here we are, we try to teach the other side, inshallah. We, we should look at all sides and be non-biased to any, any approach. So my brothers and sisters, towards the end of the life of Abu Bakr, عنه, as he ruled in justice, fairness and kindness, he became ill and sick, as I said last week in the last lesson, lesson number five. And now he had to appoint or manage appointing a new leader for the Muslims. He can't just leave them like that. The Khalifa has to bring up another Khalifa. It could have been done in so many ways. And from here we learn the first method of how a Khalifa can be appointed. But this method is if there is already a Khalifa in place. No Khalifa can be appointed without an advisory council. There has to be what we call in the Qur'an, what Allah called shura. Shura is an advisory council. They elect, and so people elect and select representatives, honorable representative among them. They could be chiefs, they could be um, uh, learned people. The, each, sometimes each tribe picks them, if they, if they were tribes, each municipality, each suburb, whatever it is. They choose representatives. Similar to when you choose MPs, members of parliament, and they represent different areas. Similar. And this advisory council was made up of a few people. Abu Bakr Adelani, when he found himself ill and sick, he started calling the noblemen. The men, when we say noblemen, meaning the men who are the, were the most respected and loved and honored by the entire Muslim community. They were very known. So among them, he called Uthman radiallahu anhu. Everybody loved Uthman, knew how important he was. And he said, Ya Uthman, I'm thinking of nominating Umar radiallahu anhu to be the Khalifa after me. I want to take your advice. What do you think of him? 
And Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Oh Abu Bakr, you are the most knowledgeable among us. And I say what you say. He said, doesn't matter, but I still want to hear your opinion. And Uthman radiallahu anhu said to him, Wallahi, I know of him only good. His private affairs, his secrecy, is far better than even what you see of him in public. Meaning he is so sincere and fears Allah in private. He will not oppress anybody, even if he's alone and nobody, can, nobody sees. Because, you know, not many people are righteous when they're alone, when they're in private. But he was. He was more righteous in private than he was in public. And I recommend him and he said, Rahimakallah, thank you, Uthman, may Allah have mercy on you. Then he said to another companion, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, another great companion from the early Muhajirin, the migrants. What do you think? He said, I think your choice is marvelous, Ya Abu Bakr. Then he called Ali radiallahu anhu. Ya Ali, what do you think of Umar? He said, Wallahi ya Amir al muminin he is among the best of us. And he is the one whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, O oh Umar, if you seek a path, and the shaitan knew it, he will go to another path because he fears him. And anybody who doesn't say that, anybody who thinks that Umar is not among the best of us, is a hypocrite. And he kept asking many of the great companions that everybody knows, until finally he got all their advice in all one word. Then he came out to the people, and he said among them, there was about a hundred or so people, he said, oh people, these were the most important around the masjid of, of the Prophet sallallahu I have selected Umar. What do you think? Do you agree with him? And they all said with one word, we all accept him, Ya Amir al-Mu'minin. So my brothers and sisters, in the time of Abu Bakr, it was very easy to elect the next Khalifa. He didn't have to have this huge thing going around the world. And it was enough, alhamdulillah, among the best of the best of the companions who were all situated in Medina. None of them had been outside, except Khalid bin Walid at that time. And all the Muslims agreed. That's it. Who can go against the Muhajireen and the Ansar? These were the migrants who migrated with the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina before his death. And they were the Ansar who welcomed the Prophet and, you know, the ones with Tala al-Badr alayna, the Ansar. Nobody would oppose them. And so the election of Umar anhu was done by nomination of Abu Bakr anhu, his choice, but only after, it was established after he had gotten the advice of everybody. So it was not just a one-man show. And so... Umar radiallahu anhu refused it, but Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu forced him until he accepted it. And Umar radiallahu anhu stood up and he said his famous statement to the people at Masjid al-Nabawi. He said in his first sermon addressing the people, O oh Allah, I am harsh, so make me lenient. Why did he say that? Because Umar radiallahu anhu was known for his harshness. He was harsh, rough and tough, and we're going to talk about his life. I'm just saying the, uh, when he was elected, and I'm going to go back to his childhood now and reach up to this point and then to the next lesson, inshallah. People used to call him harsh. Even after he was elected, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu returned back inside. And another man came in and he said to him, Don't you fear Allah, ya Abu Bakr, choosing this harsh man against the people? What are you going to say to Allah? And he was very sick. They put him up and he said to them, Are you telling me to fear Allah? Are you telling me to fear Allah because of something which I'm calling to for justice? I will say to Allah, Oh Allah, I chose a person who is just and good for the people to the best of my ability. Anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu then got up after he was elected and after the death of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was buried next to the Prophet sallallahu after seeking permission from Aisha radiallahu anha. He said, Oh Allah, I am harsh, so make me lenient. I am weak, so strengthen me. I am greedy, so make me generous. Allah has put me as a trial upon you and you as a trial upon me after my companion Abu Bakr. Your complaint to me will be heard and my judgment for you will not be overridden or stopped by anyone else. If I take anyone's right, this is my cheek. I will place it on the floor for you to step on it until I have given you your right back. If I err, make a mistake, and go off the path of Allah's book and his messenger, then stop me and prevent me. You are to me a responsibility like orphans, which I am responsible for. In other words, Umar radiallahu anhu had chosen compassion and care. 
So Abu Bakr, before him, was soft, compassionate, and care. When he became the Khalifa, he became firm and harsh. When things settled, they needed somebody to return back that softness and compassion, and he had to come from who? From the harshest man among them, Umar radiallahu anhu. And this shows you, my dear brothers and sisters, how for the sake of Allah, you can tame your behavior. You're a husband, and you're upset with your wife. Remember, she is a trust given to you by Allah. Be patient. You have a husband. Remember, he is a gift to you from Allah. How would you treat the gift that Allah has given you? For the sake of Allah, we can tame our behavior. For the sake of Allah only, a person can restrain their anger, inshallah. My brothers and sisters, now I will go back to the beginning of the life of Abu Bakr, of Umar radiallahu anhu. Now that I have introduced to you where we left off from the end of the life of Abu Bakr, Umar radiallahu anhu takes the stand. And now let's go back and talk about who this man really is. So let us begin. His name is Umar. His father's name is Al-Khattab. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to sometimes call him Umar. Sometimes he would call him Ibn Al-Khattab, son of Al-Khattab. And whenever he called him Ibn Al-Khattab, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was impressed by something he did or something that he represents. So it's a friendly way. But whenever he said Umar, it either meant he was going to give him an advice or is calling him for a mission, or he is upset with him about something. Cutting the story short, Umar radiallahu anhu, you guys won't be interested in all the tribal names and everything that's in the past. Even if I said them to you, you probably forget it. He belonged to a noble tribe among the tribes that the Quraysh respected. So he was among the people who were what we would call today in terms of elites. This is before Islam. His father was a harsh man and greedy. And in fact, he didn't have a good relationship with his father, but he respected him anyway, just because he had to. And uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, he was highly respected. Um, he was an excellent public speaker. And one of the most important things about him, he was an excellent wrestler. He knew martial arts. I don't know if they were called martial arts at that time, but he was, he was a wrestler. And he knew combat, he knew how to use weaponry. And nobody dared to mess with him. The only one who matched him in strength and wrestling, who sometimes would beat him and he would beat him, is Khalid ibn al-Walid. They were always competent. They were always combatant against each other. And some people assume that Umar and Khalid ibn al-Walid had, had, had a grudge for each other, but they didn't. Billah. But before Islam, they were, they used to always compete. Umar radiallahu anhu, he married in his entire life nine wives. There's nothing about the number nine, just in, during his entire life they got up to nine. Some died, they weren't, they weren't nine in one go, you know, not allowed to marry nine in one go. But in his lifetime before Islam and after Islam, they ended up being nine wives. Most of them were either widows or divorcees. He had 12 children. Eight boys, four girls, if you want to know their names, Abdullah, Hafsa, Ubaidullah, Asim, Zayd, Ruqayya, Iyad, Abdurrahman, Zainab, Az-Zubair, Fatima, and Abdurrahman number two. So you can name your children again if you like, but you'll just mix them up. Abdurrahman, both of them look at you. I did that to my father once in Lebanon. Actually, my uncle did it. I was standing with him and there were three guys named Khudr. My dad's name is Khudr. They were talking to each other. My uncle is a bit of a joker. He goes, watch, watch what I'm going to do to him. He goes, Khadar. All three of them replied. If you want to do that, it's a nice little trick. You've got to be a dad like me because they're called dad jokes. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, he was called the ambassador of Quraysh. However, it was an important position because all the Arabs got along, the non-Muslims. They got along in a way that... And everyone had their own pride, but they kind of were at peace, so they didn't really need an ambassador. When I say they got along, it means the big elites. They had a kind of a relationship. They were all in it together on false, you know, because, you know, when you have people who are doing the wrong, they will get along with other people doing the wrong. And you, you basically scratch each other's backs. He had an unusual courage. He was sharp-witted. He was frankness. He wore his heart on his sleeve, man. He, didn't. he was not a fake person. What he said, 
it was precise. He did not muck around. So firm, he wore his heart on his sleeve. If he said something, he meant it wholeheartedly. And he did not care what you thought. If he promised something, he was going to do it. You'd have to kill him. You'd have to kill him. He will do it. Even if you end up being wrong. If he says, I will kill you, you're dead. He will never back off, back off his word. Now that's not a good trait of a man, brothers and sisters. Don't take this as a good trait. Because after he became a Muslim, he would ask for forgiveness and he would backtrack and fix. That's a real man and a Muslim. Umar al-Khattab earned his respect. He did trade when he went to Syria. He was street smart. He was people smart. He could read you like the back of his hand. You can't trick him. Very sharp-witted Umar al-Khattab. But he was very harsh and strict. He was 12 years younger than the Prophet wasallam. And he was about 27 years old when the Prophet ﷺ came out as a prophet. To describe his features, he was extra tall. I would give him a meter 90 or maybe 188 centimeters. He was built and strong, solid, muscly, very big voice. Yeah, and when he spoke, it's like he had a microphone. He'll whisper and you hear him at the end of the masjid. He was bold, lost his hair, but he had hair everywhere else. <laughs> and he was red haired. He was a red hair. And whatever he had of hair, he grew it long to his shoulders. His skin was whitish, Caucasian skin, because he had redness in his face. He was red hair, as I said. And his hair always dangled, as I said. Sometimes he would braid it. That was Umar ibn al-Khattab. His relationship to the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr was that the Prophet, peace be upon him, married his daughter, Hafsa. Anha, and Umar married Abu Bakr's son's widowed wife. Abu Bakr had a son named Abdullah. And there's a long story about it. We don't have time to talk about it, but it was a... They, were the, they, were, they have a romantic story. Rami and Juliet has nothing, is nothing compared to the son of Abdullah, the son of Abu Bakr Abdullah and his wife. And this particular wife of Abdullah, the son of Abu Bakr, they used, she used to write poetry to him, he wrote poetry to her. And there came a time when Abdullah even missed out on Jumu'ah prayer because he was on a honeymoon stage with his wife. And his father told him, you have to leave your wife because she can't stop you from your salat. And then he separated from him and started crying and Abu Bakr felt sorry for him. So he said, return, but don't forget your deen. If your deen is gone, your marriage, your life is gone. And he was martyred, radiallahu anhu. And his wife wrote a poem. She says in some eloquent words, I will never marry anyone after you, my love. You are the end and that's it. I will die and you'll be my husband in Jannah and all of that stuff. After her idda was over, three menstrual cycles, Umar al-Khattab came and asked for her in marriage, and she said yes. <laughs> and Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali, before they did the katbiktab, the contract of marriage, he comes in, Ali radiallahu anhu, and he says to Umar radiallahu anhu, Ya Umar, if you give me permission before you marry her, can I say a few words to her? He said, go ahead. And then he reminded her, he, he said a few sentences of her own poetry. I will never marry anyone after you and my love and in Jannah we meet. She just put her head down. <laughs> what can she say? So she became the wife of Umar radiallahu anhu. I'll just cut the story short. I could have made it much nicer, but we're not talking romance here. We're talking about Umar radiallahu anhu. You ain't going to hear a romantic story from Umar radiallahu anhu. So now we move on. We all said that Umar always disagreed with Abu Bakr. So among the first things when, so as he grew up, but let's move on to his childhood, subhanAllah. Subhanallah. Abu Bakr, um, Umar anhu, actually I want to talk a bit about his traits, just to give you a good idea of what he was like when he did become a Muslim as well. So he is the one whom the Prophet wasallam said, the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. That if there was a prophet after me, 
it would have been Umar. The Prophet وسلم, he said, لو كان نبيا من بعدي لكان Umar. If there was a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. But there is no prophet after me. And he said, I am the seal of all the prophets. I am the last, the end. And one time, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was walking with Umar. Umar was walking with him. And he said, Ya Umar, you will never enter paradise until I am more beloved to your heart than everything. And Umar anhu said, Ya Rasul Allah, I love you more than everything except myself. Remember when I told you he's very frank. He said, La Ya Umar, not until I'm more beloved to you than yourself. Why? Because I'm the messenger of Allah. You're not loving me as a person, you're loving me as a messenger of Allah more than yourself. So Umar then stopped and thought about it for a few, for a little moment. And then he goes, Ya Rasulullah, now I love you more than myself. He says, what changed? He said, I thought about my habits and my character and I thought about yours. And every character I had, you were better than me. So how can I love myself more than you? There's things I hate about myself. There's nothing I hate about you. I, I love you more than myself. He said, Al-ana ya Umar. Now you have reached true piety. That you love the Messenger of Allah more than yourself. Allah did say in the Quran, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ To the Messenger of Allah, He said, You are on the best of character. Allah didn't say that to anyone else. And you want to love yourself more than that? So that's how Umar thought about it. The Messenger of Allah is something else. And subhanallah, here's a funny story about, just so you can understand the character of Umar, it did not change from when he was a disbeliever to when he was a believer, but what he did with it was, he just channeled, he channeled his outrageous character into a good direction. You know, brothers and sisters, some of us were born with certain personalities that you can't get rid of. You're literally born like that. Some of us are genetic, we inherit it. And that's why when a mother breastfeeds a child, the child takes in some of the genetics that come with the milk in the beginning of their birth from the mother. And they take some of the mother's and father's traits, even of behavior. And you can break that cycle and your genetics will change. And this is also a scientific fact, by the way, in biology. But Rasul Sallallahu also said that. He said, you, there are many hadiths about it. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he inherited certain traits and he had them, but, it, but he couldn't change them when he became a Muslim. Instead, some of them, he channeled them. So if he got angry, he channeled his anger towards good. If he cried, he cried towards good, like that. And that's how all the companions did, brothers and sisters. And that's what we can do. You have a problem with certain characteristics that you have, try and work it, channel it towards a direction that you can benefit a lot. Use your anger in a way that develops and makes things better, inshallah. I remember once I got angry and stressed and I couldn't sleep the night. I went on YouTube and learned how to build a pergola. You know what a pergola is? That's where I released my energy and anger. I had a pergola worth 10 grand, which I built with $2,000. Well, like everyone who saw it, they go, who's the guy who built it for you? I said, me. They said, you can do anything. But the thing is, I was angry. Now, I'm not always angry. If I got angry, imagine what I can build, huh? So you guys can channel your emotions, inshallah, in the right direction. This is a good form of training and it needs another course on its own. One time, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now this is beautiful about the Prophet, peace be upon him. He was very compassionate to the women. And he looked after their affairs and made sure that they also got what the men got and that is knowledge and understanding. And they had their right to worship. He even used to say, don't prevent the women, the servants of Allah, from the, from the houses of Allah. And if they want to go to the masjid in the night, let them go. So the women asked the Prophet ﷺ that they wanted lessons from him directly. They wanted to ask him questions, give them time in the week so they can sit down and they can learn from him directly without the presence of the men. And the Prophet ﷺ gave them that. He used to meet with them several times a week. So one time, and the hadith, by the way, is in Sahih Bukhari, this one. It's in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 3683. Umar radiallahu anhu then comes and asks, doesn't know that the Prophet is giving a lesson to the women, and he asks permission to enter. As he was about to, and as he asked permission to enter, 
Omar overheard the women. They were getting comfortable with talking over the Prophet Sallallahu voice. They talked over him. They didn't deliberately do that out of disrespect, but they were excited. And lots of women would ask questions at the same time. So Abu Bakr got upset about that. He said, they're overwhelming him. This is disrespect. This is to him. But it wasn't to the Prophet, peace be upon him. He, he understood. He gave reasons and excuses. When they heard Umar radiallahu anhu's voice, Astaghdinuka ya Rasulallah. <laughs> Give me permission, O Messenger of Allah. Obviously five times bigger than my voice. The women heard him. They all went dead silent. And they raced behind the screen and hid behind it. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Enter ya Umar. And Umar al found the Prophet, peace be upon him, laughing. <laughs> he said, Ya Umar, <laughs> what's going on? Look, you entered... And you scared the women off. And then Omar said, They're afraid of me, but they don't fear you. You have more right to be respected and feared than me, Ya Rasulullah. Look at them talking over your voice. I got angry at that. And the Rasul Sallallahu kept laughing and said, Ihin Ya Umar. No, he said, Ihin Ya Ibn Al Khattab. Remember, I told you he called him nice. It's like saying, Ah, you son of a gun, like that. I swear by Almighty Allah who possesses my soul in his hand. There isn't a pathway that you choose to walk on. And the shaitan sees it except the shaitan goes and chooses another pathway. He will not walk in the place you are walking. The shaitan is afraid of him. And Umar Dallahu, after becoming a Muslim, he used to cry a lot. He became compassionate. When the Prophet used to tell him that, he started weeping. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you are the one to deserve the ultimate respect. But Rasul Sallallahu he understood and gave way to people. He was compassionate. One time, one time, uh, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 1479. Umar Abdul Khattab enters... He asked permission to enter upon the Prophet Sallallahu house for the first time. He went to visit him. The Prophet gave him permission. Umar radiallahu anhu entered. He was happy and, and smiling. Umar radiallahu anhu sat down. And the Prophet peace be upon him was lying down on his bed. Then he sat up. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was lying on his bed. And then he sat up. His bed was on the floor. It was a layer of straw. One layer. That's it. That was his bed. And when the Prophet ﷺ sat up, Umar radiallahu anhu's smile looked away, uh, faded away, and he started to cry. Umar started to cry. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ma yubkika ya Umar? What is making you cry, Ya Umar? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I looked around in your house. You have a straw mat that's only one layer. You got up and I can see the marks of it on the side of your body. Looks like he was wearing a short sleeve. I can see the marks of your straw. Is this your bed? So I looked at your pillow. It's got rough, coarse leaves and stuff in there. I can see its mark on your cheeks, Ya Rasulullah. He said, I looked at the Prophet's cupboard and I saw a handful of barley in a small amount. The same of mimosa leaves in the corner and a leather bag hanging to the side. My eyes started to tear up. And I said, O Prophet of Allah, why should I not cry that this mat has left marks on your side and I see little in this cupboard? Caesar and Cosro, meaning the, the, the emperor of Rome and the emperor of Persia, live among fruits and springs while you are the messenger of Allah and he has chosen you. Wa anta fi hadha. 
and this is your state? The Prophet sallallahu then said, Ya ibn al-Khattab, O oh, son of al-Khattab, Ala yurdika anna lahum dunya walana al-akhira? Are you not pleased that they are for us in the hereafter and for them only in this world? I said, of course, O Messenger of Allah. And this was the same thing that Umar radiallahu anhu practiced when he became the Khalifa. He would refuse to sleep on more than one mattress, layer of straws, or a coarse pillow. And there came a time when the Muslims were hungry because of a drought. And he refused to eat food so long as there, are, there was one hungry person in the city. He would rather resort to bread, stale bread, and olive oil. He'd dip it and eat it until his stomach hurt. And his daughter Hafsa, radiallahu anha, and Aisha, radiallahu anha, they used to say to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, don't go like that. Your clothing are patched up. It's embarrassing, at least let's look like we look after our leader. And he reminded them about the Prophet He said to her, Ya Aisha, Ya Hafsa, my daughter, didn't you tell me one time Rasul went three days without food or water, without food? Didn't you tell me one time Rasul Sallallahu you could not find for one week anything in his house except water and dates? Didn't you remind me that this and that and until they all started to cry? He said, yes, he says, I will not touch anything until the people and the citizens have eaten and drunk, and I will not do more than that. I am not better than the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So my brothers and sisters, Umar al Khattab is something else. So back to when he was a non-Muslim. It was that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the Kaaba one day. The Kaaba. And it was the message of Islam that was still new. And the Prophet وسلم, made a dua to Allah. He said, O oh Lord, make Islam strong with either of the two men, Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab. Abu Jahl's name was Amr ibn Hisham and there was Umar. And sometimes he would say, Allahumma a'izza al-Islam bi ihda al-Umarain. O oh Allah, bring strength to Islam with one of these two Umrs. Abu Jahl was the greatest staunch in enemy against the Prophet وسلم, and Umar. And Allah chose Umar radiallahu anhu. Because something inside of Umar's heart made him deserve the guidance. Brothers and sisters, you might be asking, why would God choose? Does that mean that God chose me to be a Muslim? If you remember, I gave a talk, four lessons about qada and qadr. Do you remember those, those lessons who came? And we explained what it means when God guides you. It means when Allah sees you. I want you to remember this principle. When Allah knows that in your heart there is a tiny area that is open to guidance, the moment you show the tiniest willingness, Allah will set the guidance and let you see it. But if there is not in your heart, or maybe there could be, but you never have shown willingness, Allah will not show you the guidance. You cannot see it. You have to make the choice first. Some of you have come in here and said, I've come here to learn. I want to learn about the deen. Allah sees in your heart a willingness. And watch the guidance. You start seeing and learning and, and you realize things that you didn't realize before. But some come in here because they, they have bad intentions. That person will not see the guidance of what we are talking about. They cannot. Because their intention wasn't right. And Allah will not let a person like that see the guidance because you've blinded yourself. Do you understand? So my brothers and sisters, Umar al-Khattab had that in his heart. And he was honest, honest. Yes, he said words that hurt people, but he was honest. So Umar al-Khattab was a tyrant before Islam. And everyone who had converted to Islam from his own family, he would trap them. Chain them up and whip them, men and women, days after days in public in front of everybody. He would say, I will not, I will start with my own family, he would say. My own family. And everybody feared him tremendously, Omar radiallahu anhu. He wronged so many people before. And he was so stubborn 
that the Arabs agreed, the Arabs agreed that he would be the absolute last person to convert to Islam. Last. Nobody in their wildest dreams, friend or foe, ever crossed their mind that Omar would one day become a Muslim. Which tells me and you, brothers and sisters, never judge a person's potential guidance. Every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. Every Muslim who is sinful is potential to repent to Allah. Do not point your fingers and don't play God. How do you know? We don't know. Don't. Talk in general. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the story of Umar radiallahu anhu's uh, conversion starts when one day he found out that the Muslims were escaping their hometown. They were escaping Mecca. Remember the Hijra, the migration. And where was the first place they were going to, to migrate to? Does anyone remember? Al-Habasha. Ethi. Say Amo. What is it? Ethiopia. No? Khalas, young boy said no. I don't dare to speak anymore. <laughs> you are right. He went, they went to Ethiopia. Abyssinia. And Rasul used to say, uh, and Najashi, the king of of Ethiopia is a just ruler. He was a Christian, but he was just and fair, and nobody was oppressed. So the Muslims were migrating to there. So among them was a woman by the name of Umm Abdullah bintu Abu Hanifa. Not the Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa, if you know who I'm talking about. That was an old name. And her husband's name was Abu Abdullah. So Umm Abdullah and Abu Abdullah. And what happened with her is that they were trying to get out of Mecca secretly because anybody who caught them, they would trap them. They tried to run away. As she was leaving with Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah, he wanted to go ahead of her to make sure it's safe. So he went up and there was a hill and he said, meet me at the hill there. I'll make sure the, the, the path is clear. As she was going, secretly and carefully, she hears a big voice behind her. But it was whispering. But it was still big. Who was it? Umar radiallahu anhu. She was so scared. Out of all the people, why Umar? She thought he's going to trap her. She's gone. She's finished. And he said, Ila aina ya Umm Abdullah. Where are you going, Umm Abdullah? Now, she was scared, but you know how when somebody's trapped, the last resort they have is to try and show some strength. So she turned around and said, I'm leaving. He said, you are leaving us, Ya Umm Abdullah. But he didn't raise his voice. And in his voice, she noticed there was some softness. She's never heard him like that. That gave her more strength to even go stronger at him. So she said, yes, Wallahi will travel in God's land away from your tyranny and your oppression to us. And she stood firmly. Now Umar could have grabbed her and just broken her in half. But he looked at her, he replies with a face of compassion. He almost cried. And he said, Sahabatki salama, may peace be with you. Umm Abdullah says, she narrates it, she says, I saw a kindness from him never seen before and a sadness in his eyes I had never seen. Why? He was listening to the Qur'an of the Prophet ﷺ which had softened his heart over these few years. But he was stubborn. When Umm Abdullah reached her husband, he said, why were you late? She said, Umar bin al-Khattab stopped me. He said, are you okay? What happened to you? And she just smiled to her husband and said, Oh, if only you saw Umar. If only you saw Umar just then, his face and eyes were sad. And he was compassionate. And Abu Abdullah said to her, And let me guess, you think that he's going to become a Muslim? She said, yes. And he said to her, Umm Abdullah, if his donkey became a Muslim, I'd believe you. And I would never believe you to say that he became a Muslim. 
his donkey would become a Muslim and not him. Subhanallah, she said, I don't know. I don't believe you. And they migrated. That was the first sign of the compassion of Umar radiallahu anhu. And truly, Umar radiallahu anhu was known that it was the Qur'an that softened his heart. And when the Qur'an softens your heart, you begin to see compassion in front of you. Because Allah did say, فِيهِ شِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ In the Qur'an there is medicine. It cures what is in the hearts. And he said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ A messenger of God, we have sent you as nothing but a mercy to all people. How can a Qur'an not soften the heart? Except for those who want to close it. So my brothers and sisters, Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, had converted three days before that. And Hamza was known to be, you know, he was just something else. No, everybody feared him. Even Umar feared him. And after his conversion, the non-Muslims were so scared that the Muslims are getting more powerful now because Hamza had become Muslim. Nobody would dare to mess with him. So Umar, instead of converting to Islam, because he felt sorry for Umm um Abdullah and the rest, he turned his sorrow and sadness into anger and rage. He goes, he started turning his rage towards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, look at this man, he's come up and divided our entire community and now these poor victims are leaving their home. Why should they have to do that? He just looked in the wrong direction. But he, he wasn't doing anything, he was the one being victimized, he was the one being attacked. Because he spoke some words that people didn't like. My brothers and sisters, and so he said, I will kill him with my own sword and let his clan kill me after that. So he looked at it as chivalry. He looked at it as a good deed. He, he thought he was doing something good. Now, there are many stories about Umar radiallahu conversion. And there's the famous story of when he went to Fatima his sister, when he found out she had converted to Islam, I don't know if you know this story, and when he heard the Surah Taha, and he converted after hearing Surah Taha, and there are other stories about him, but to be honest with you, all of them have weak narrations in their chain, so they're not strong, reliable, however, because there's so many of them, I will tell you the most famous of these stories, that if there is any one of them reliable, this probably would be the most reliable, give and take. So the story that the historians go by is that Umar radiallahu anhu took his sword and put it and then he, he uncovered his sword. And when the Arabs did that, it meant that he was going to go and kill someone. So as he went by, he passed by one of the, uh, one of the men who was respected and he said, Where are you going, ya Umar Mutawash, mut, um, mut, um, um, Mutawahish? Um, what's the word for it? Mutawahishun Saifak? Muta, Mutawahish and Saifak, I think, yeah. And he said, where are you going with your sword unsheathed? And he said, I'm going to kill that man who's divided my clan. And this man had become Muslim in secret. And said to him, well, if you're going to go and kill him, why don't you go start with your own family, you chivalrous man. Your own sister Fatima converted in secret. Because my sister, oh, and then he went straight to his sister's house. The story goes that he knocked on the door heavily. And before he knocked, he overheard somebody inside reciting words of the Qur'an. Fatima looked through the keyhole and she saw it was her brother. Her husband is Sa'd, radiallahu anhu. And with them was another companion named Khabbab. Now that's true. Khabbab ibn al-Arat, radiallahu anhu, was among the first companions who memorized from the Qur'an. He used to teach it to others. So he was sitting there teaching him how to read the Qur'an. So she hid him inside. And she came and opened the door for Omar and hid the, the, the pieces of paper somewhere. Omar entered with harshness. And he said, what are these words that I heard you speaking? She said, nothing, 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 my brother, nothing. And he said, I want to see what you were reading. Don't lie to me. And he had a bit of a scuffle with, with, his, with her husband and put him to the floor. And then she came towards him to protect her husband and he punched her to the floor which made her lips bleed. Part of that story is true. And the part of that that's true is that Umar radiallahu anhu, for the second time, his heart became more compassionate. He had never touched his sister in his life, even before Islam. And that day, his rage overtook him. 
And when he saw his sister on the floor and he had punched her, his heart just melted. He said, just, just, just give me, just let me see what you were reading. And Fatima sensed in him, his sister, he's just putting on a show, like he's angry, but really inside him he wants to read. You know that type of person just tries to hide their stubbornness, they're just too, their ego is just too high? But she sensed it. And she said, I'll give it to you after you go and wash yourself. He said, why? He says, because you're a kafir, and the kafir is too dirty to touch these words. So he went and bathed. He really wants to read them. She got him. And he came and read those verses. Now, we know that he read verses. Which ones in particular, we don't know. But as I told you, this is probably the closest to reliability that he read the first parts of Surah Taha. Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an li tashqa illa tazkiratan li man yakhsha. O oh, Muhammad, we have not sent, maybe Taha means Muhammad. He said, we have not sent this Qur'an down upon you so that you can live a life of misery or to lose. But accept a reminder for those whose hearts, for those whose hearts fear or are softened or want to know. And it goes on, beautiful words, which made Umar who cry for the first time hearing the Qur'an. He said, take me to the messenger of God. And Fatima and Sa'ad took him. They got someone to take him to Dar al-Arqam, a place where the Muslims were hiding and meeting in secret because people wanted to kill them. He knocked on the door, and this is true here. This is now authentic from here onwards. He knocked on the door, and the, uh, I don't know which companion looked, and he saw that it was Umar. He comes back inside and he starts to sort of get scared. And he said, it's Omar, it's Omar, we are finished, we're dead. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at him and Hamza says a few words. He says, so what? Open the door. If he tries to harm us, we'll kill him. Hamza. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiled and said, everybody sit down. It's good news. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to the door. He opened it. Omar had his hand down. He looked at the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Prophet immediately grabs hold of him so tight pulls him towards him and he gets off his feet. He literally carries him up and pins him to the wall. And he says to him in staunchness, Is it not time that you embrace Islam, Ya Umar, before something befalls you? And he Rasul had made dua for him. And he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka Rasulullah. He fell to his knees and he converted. He said, I never felt the strength of the Prophet ﷺ until this day. He was a strong man. He said, I was like a, in other words, like a rag doll in front of him. Literally shook him apart. He goes, and that's all I needed. That day, you know, I told you Omar is very frank. He doesn't care what people think. Doesn't give a damn. And he comes up. So he goes around and he goes, hmm. Who's the best person I want to go and tell that I became a Muslim? I want to go to the worst person. And he thinks of Abu Jahl, the worst of them all. Abu Jahl was his uncle. He goes, knocks on his door. He goes, hey, my nephew. He goes, didn't you hear I became a Muslim? He goes, you, you joined the nomads? He said, no, I became a Muslim. He goes, damn you and damn this day that you came with me. Get out of my face. So he went laughing. And then he thought, he told a few people and he goes, you know what? This is taking too much effort. I want everybody to know. And there was a, a man over there whose name was, um, what was his name? Anyway, this particular man, he was known to be the snitch of Mecca. You say one thing, always snitched. So he goes up to this snitch, he says, Oi, he goes, Omar. He goes, didn't you hear I became a Muslim? He goes, the nomads? He goes, no, no, Muslim. And he just runs off. Within an hour, the entire people of Mecca come and surround Umar radiallahu anhu. Maybe a hundred men. Oh, you left your own religion, you're a loser, you're a low life, you're a whatever. We're going to bash you, we're going to kill you. He goes, I dare you. And then each man starts rushing at him and he starts to fight them and they're fighting him. Now, not everybody rushed at the same time. But he stayed fighting, 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 probably one, two hours. Until in the end he got so tired and he was bloodied everywhere. 
So he sat to the ground and couldn't get up. And then he goes, I've got to get out of this. So he saw one of the oldest men among them, but respected. He grabs him, chokes him and puts his fingers in his eyes and said, I swear I will poke his eyes out. And everybody backed off. And that's when they allowed him to leave slowly and he managed to get out of there. He went to the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet just laughed. He just looking at him thinking, oh, Omar, now wasn't the time. And Umar said to him, Ya Rasulullah, are we not on the truth? He said, yes. He said, hasn't Allah honored us? He said, yes. He said, then why are we hiding still? Let's go out, Ya Rasulullah. And Umar had said to those disbelievers who attacked him, he said, when he was sitting down with his, about to poke the old man's, the, the man's eyes out, he said, I swear, all we need are 300 Muslim men and all of you will be annihilated. And subhanAllah, he only said it right, but remember when I told you he's so sharp, that was exactly or close to the amount of men they had in the first battle of Badr. They had 314 or 315 men and the disbelievers of Quraysh who had come to kill them, to attack them, they were 1,000. And that was the battle of Badr. SubhanAllah, it just happens to coincide. And you'll see now with Umar, everything he says happens to coincide with, like he almost knew exactly what will happen. So he said to him, why are we silent? That day Rasul agreed with him. And Hamza, Umar and the Prophet led the group of Muslims into Mecca publicly declaring the shahada without fear for the first time since the message of the Prophet ﷺ was revealed. And that was about the sixth year or the fifth year. And what did the disbelievers do? They saw an opportunity to go and annihilate the Muslims. But when they saw Hamza and Umar, I think it was Al-Walid ibn Mughida or Utba, one of the chiefs, he said, don't. Any group of people who have Hamza and Umar among them, only a crazy, insane person will go and mess with them. Leave them alone. Others, they said, don't attack them because the rest of the Arab tribes will say, look at you, you attacked weak people, you have no nobility, because this is a big thing for the Arabs. So my brothers and sisters, that was the day the Prophet ﷺ called Umar the famous nickname Al-Farooq. Al-Farooq was Umar ibn Khattab's nickname. Abu Bakr was, who can remember? As-Siddiq. And Umar is now Al-Farooq. Al-Farooq means the divider. The divider between truth and false, right and wrong. There are no hypocrites around him. He literally sifts right through them and everybody's exposed. That's why it was called Al-Farooq. Because he was sharp and witty, nobody could hide their true face. And, that, and that's how he was as a Khalifa. Everything was black and white. And now when I tell you his story about how he was a Khalifa and how he governed, you guys, we're gonna, you're going to say to me, is he, a, is, like, is he a human? He went so extreme on himself and easy on the people that inshallah next week I will talk about his life as the Khalifa of the Muslims and obviously you all know the story of when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died and what Umar did, he took the stance. And I talked to you about this in the last lesson, so I'm not going to repeat it again, inshallah. But you know, he took a very strong stance and Abu Bakr put him in place. So the only one who ever put Umar in place was Abu Bakr or the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After that, no one else could put him in place except some, a couple of weak people in the society who used the words of Allah and he used to humble himself. So inshallah we'll talk about his amazing governance as the Khalifa, how he treated the people, the amazing things that he established that we still have till today. One example is social security. You know when you're jobless, you're unemployed or a single mother or a single father and you don't have a job or whatever, the government obviously gives you um, welfare assistance and this actually started with Umar radiallahu anhu. No other land, no other people in civilization, or at least in that time, had this system. It was called Bayt Mal al-Muslimin, social security, like Centrelink. So Umar radiallahu anhu established that. He also established um, quality control among business and products and trade, among other beautiful things that, inshallah, 
we will um, be proud in knowing about him next week, insha'Allah ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, I'll stop here, insha'Allah. If any of you, because I, I um, brothers were telling me that you have a lot of questions and they were asking me if I can have a Q&A day. So I said, look, how about next class, insha'Allah? We'll leave a little bit of time. How much time do we have? Maybe 15 minutes? 10 minutes? 9.35, I think, isn't it? What time is Aisha here? We said, Jamal? Naam? We have about 20 minutes. So, wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, next week we'll continue lesson number seven, inshallah ta'ala. Um, I think Bilal, if you have any questions written from last week or this week, inshallah, and if any of the brothers would like any clarifications. Now, I'm not a mufti, my knowledge is limited, and if I can know the answer, inshallah, I'll let you know. If not, I will say I don't know it, and inshallah, I can go and do some research and uh, seek help from my sheikhs and uh, scholars. Inshallah, we can come back to you with with answers bi idnihi ta'ala. Remind me of the question. Oh, did, okay, brother here is reminding me of a question. If a woman is in, during her menstruation, can she sit in the masjid? And we had a little bit of a a back and forth uh, debate here with some of you. Um, and this is a matter of opinion, really. Uh, so we said that the top level of this masjid was intended to be built as a recreational place for, for all sorts of services and events. And it was not meant to be part of the, the, the initial masjid here. So if that was the intention and this is what um, the plans were and everybody who donated, they knew the plans, it was made public, then I, I, um, I am satisfied, inshallah, that women during their menstruation can sit in that section since it's not the masjid itself. And that's if we followed the opinion of the scholars, uh, which is the majority, that uh, a woman in her menstruation should not sit in the, in the actual masjid. There is also a minority opinion that they believe that no, it doesn't apply, um, doesn't apply if there is a reason for her to go and sit in the masjid. So that's my answer to that, inshallah. Uh, and one of the evidences they cite is the authentic hadith. I think it's in Sahih Muslim about Aisha radiallahu anha, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told her to ask her to go into the masjid and get him something that he had left there. I think it was his red blanket or something like that, and she said to him, I have my menstruation. He said, it's not in your hands. And they, and they gave it a couple of interpretations. Not in your hands means literally, your hand has nothing to do with it, you're touching in the masjid, and it's not in your control, the other side. They said, since it's not in your control, why should you be prevented from the mosque? So these are the two opinions, Yani, because what she did, she went in and then came back out. And the other minority opinion, I told you majority opinion, is safer not to, but the other opinion is, it's not in your hands, meaning it's not in your control. She can go in and sit there if there is a reason, Yani. And what we did here, alhamdulillah, in this masjid is that it's separated. So we have a solution, alhamdulillah. Uh, that's all we can say about that. Mm. Okay. So another question from our sister says, a female makeup artist, what does Islam say about that? My brothers and sisters, in Islam, wearing makeup is halal. For a woman, wearing makeup is halal. Now, I know all of you are thinking, or maybe some of you are thinking, if he says halal, you're thinking she's going to go outside in public, that's what you're thinking. Wearing makeup is halal, but there are conditions to it in Islam. Right? And the type of makeup that we're talking about. Some makeup is not makeup, it, it's not, it doesn't... It doesn't uh, show, like for example, foundation. Some women have blemishes in their skin. They put something that's the same color as their skin to cover the blemishes. That's okay. And she can go out in it. But Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Women should cover themselves but not reveal their adornments and decorations except what she has no control over. 
In another verse, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِنَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا لِبُعُولَتِهِنْ And to not reveal their adornments and decorations except to their husbands and also to their mahrams. Mahram means people, men who can, she can never marry. And there is a division, there's a divided uh, tafsir on this particular verse. Some say, إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Whatever appears of her, they meant the face and the hands. And they included in the face of the hands that if she was wearing makeup, that's, that's okay. But the correct opinion, and that's the majority opinion, is that if the makeup is so obvious that it enhances, enhances the eyes and enhances the lips, for example, that's particular there, it's the, the lips and the eyes, then it is forbidden for a woman to go out with that. It's a minor sin. And that should be reserved to her husband. Because it is an enhanced, attractive beauty that Allah loves for husband and wives to enjoy. Because it, it attracts nicely. And Allah doesn't want a woman whom He created to share this enhancement and this beauty with other people. Beauty is her modesty. Beauty is your character. Beauty is your hijab. Beauty is obeying Allah. That's where the beauty is. But wearing makeup for a woman is not haram. She can wear it in her house. She can wear it in front of other women. She can wear it in front of a mahram. She can wear it to an occasion. So to become a makeup artist is not haram. But the person who wears that makeup and enhances it, how they use it, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold them accountable to. How do you use that? It's like me selling you grapes. You can use the grapes to make wine. And you can use the grapes to make a fruit salad. Is it my fault? It's not my fault. So in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to dye the hair. Men dyed hair, women dyed hair. Women beautified women for their marriages, for occasions. So it's allowed. But it's your responsibility to use it correctly. I hope inshallah, in a nutshell, I've given the answer. Yeah, brother is asking in relation to the jizya that we talked about, the tax that non-Muslims who are living as citizens or residents under Islamic rule, what is the, tax, the jizya amount? Brother, it was a small amount, but subhanAllah, I've just forgotten how much the amount was. It's actually a very small amount. And I will add, though, that non-Muslims living under Islamic rule, if they are poor, if they're in, under the poverty line, they don't pay any jizya. We use our zakat to help them. <laughs> so, yani, it's, uh, Islam is, is fair and just and merciful, alhamdulillah. That's it? Yeah, that's all the questions that we... <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. Yeah. No, brother is asking... And I think sisters asked what we were talking about salat the other day, that if, if a woman, can a woman pr pray with her makeup on, or can she make wudu with her makeup on? Well, that depends. Praying with your makeup on is fine. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. A woman's prayer is not affected by having makeup on, even if it's enhanced makeup. However, wudu, and this goes for men and women, anything, I'm not going to call it makeup, any substance that goes on your body in the places where for wudu, the water has to reach your skin, so the arms up to the elbows, the face, um, the legs, the ears a little bit. If you've got something on there, a layer that stops the water, prevents the water from reaching your skin, it must come off. So if there is makeup that's so heavy that water cannot get through to your skin, then obviously the wudu is invalid. And that's what you've got to watch out for, inshallah. I'm not going to go into the different cosmetics and into all that stuff now because that will never end. I know about it, alhamdulillah, a little bit. I've researched a bit about it. You know, the nail polish, are permeable, non-permeable, and all that stuff, right? And the eyelashes and the extensions and the glue that they use and all of that, right? But right now, we don't have time to talk about all of that. However, just take it as a principle. Anything that prevents the water from reaching 
the part of your skin that you're supposed to have for wudu has to come off before making wudu because your wudu is invalidated. All right, but the scholars did talk about if it's a lot or just a minute amount. If it's very minute amount, it doesn't affect you. Okay, I hope inshallah that covers it. Yeah, and it, I have some of our brothers here, mashallah, they look beautiful with the kahl on their eyes. Some of them, mashallah, they have natural kahl. You have natural kahl, tabarakallah, the eyeliner. This is called makeup, but it's halal makeup, and it doesn't affect the men, and it shouldn't affect the women at all. I hope, inshallah, I was balanced in that answer. Yes, brother. Mm. Yep. Brother is asking about wiping over the socks. Now, this has several opinions among the schools of thought. And it depends which school of thought that you follow. It's all okay, inshallah. And we spoke about this in our lecture on Salat last time when we did the, the seven-part series or eight-part series. And we said that the most authentic hadith talk about Rasulullah wearing khuf, khuf are leather, leather socks. They are leather. And they are made of animal leather. So he used to wipe over them, the Sahaba used to wipe over them. But then there are also other hadiths who talk about jawarib. And jawrab uh, can be any material. Khuf is literally leather. The other hadiths talk about jawrab. Some of them are weak, some of them are authentic. Some of them, lots of weak ones come together. And uh, there is the other group of scholars, which is the majority. That wiping over the socks, if they are not made of leather, it's okay for wudu, if you follow that madhab. But the condition is they have to be thick socks. As for the thin socks and holes, honestly, the scholars of hadith have said that it is not authentic. All right, like there's some hadith talking about where, the, where there's the, the socks were thin or there were holes in them and stuff like that. And the, the correct opinion, inshallah, is that they have to be thick socks. I would have lifted my legs up right now for you, but it would be rude. I'm wearing them right now, thick socks. And it has to be one night, or sorry, just uh, yani one day over that you've worn them. If you're on travel, it's three nights and three days. But there's more detail to it. I'll just leave it at that. There's more detail to it, inshallah. Jamal. Yes, so the conditions are that once you make normal wudu and you wash your feet normally, then immediate, and then afterwards, before you lose your wudu, you wear those thick socks or the leather socks, the leather. And from that point, if you lose your wudu, from the point you lost your wudu, you can wipe over them, and then you count a day and a night for them. So that's the only condition. Okay, so how, can, how long can you shorten the prayer? And we also covered that in the seven-week uh, lectures that we did here. But just very quickly, um, it is unanimous among the scholars, the four schools of thought, that you can shorten your prayer so the, 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 the dhuhr becomes two, the asr becomes two, and naisha becomes two. But the difference of opinion is about joining them together. So having dhuhr and asr together in one time. And the majority opinion is that you can join them together and the evidence is strong. Do you get it? On Safar, what's another topic now? Okay, I refer you to our lecture. You'll find it on YouTube or the Facebook page of Preston Mosque where I did a whole class only on that. So I need to give more detail, inshallah. All right, how long do you have to be on Safar? But in a nutshell, if you want to be on the safe side, the safe side, four days. Safe side. But again, it's not the only valid opinion with evidence. Okay? Alhamdulillah. I think it's time. All right. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.